Welcome to Restaurant Relevance, the podcast, where the goal is to glean operational tactics for restaurant operators from data-driven research, definitely nerding out along the way. I'm Nathan Jarvis, the host. Welcome to those of you who are tuning in. In today's episode, we're featuring research published in Poetics, not a journal you normally think about for restaurant research, uh, but it is today. And the title of this paper is Death of the Secret Recipe, Open Source Cooking and Field Organization in the Culinary Arts. I'm super excited about this research for a number of uh, reasons. One, this is really a continuation of our episode with Dr. Kaishan Lee a few months ago, uh, focusing on his research on pastry chefs. He used today's research we're gonna feature uh, to build his work. And so really we're kind of going backwards uh, in a way, looking to uh, under uncover some of the underpinnings of Dr. Lee's work uh, and this with uh, our work uh, today. It's fascinating. It's interesting to me either we have a researcher who's not in the field of hospitality or culinary arts doing this research and uh, his ideas and theories that came out of his research I find are quite fascinating. So I'm excited to feature it today. It ought to be a wonderful conversation. So let's jump right in. We're fortunate to have the author of the research with us today. Dr. Chad Borkenhagen is a postdoctoral research scholar at the Interdisciplinary Center for Innovative Theory and Empirics at Columbia University. His work examines culture and knowledge in a wide range of organizational contexts, including the culinary arts, quantitative finance, and higher education. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago and a BA from Columbia University. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you here today. So I want to start at a 30,000 foot, you know, uh, overview here. You've got some really interesting stuff in your paper, but in just a few sentences, could you tell us, you know, what your study was about and what you found? Sure, sure. So uh, more broadly, what I was interested in is uh, understanding how uh, this sort of movement of modernist chefs were uh, both learning science and incorporating that into their work. And then how that was changing their community and the field uh, more broadly. Uh, what I found in the context of our conversation here in the specific article we're going to be talking about was that um, not only had these chefs adopted scientific knowledge, so you know, understandings of molecules that are working through cooking processes and whatnot, but they'd also uh, adopted a lot of these scientific practices along the way, and those practices had some interesting implications for kind of the, the hierarchies that we see in the culinary industry. Interesting. So, I mean, how, how did you get to this topic? Uh, looking at your background, it doesn't look like you've worked in, really worked in restaurants a lot before, or you know, a lot of involvement in the modernist movement. So how did you get to this topic? What was the origin <laughs> here? Um, yes, yeah, so the, um, it's true that I have no background in uh, the culinary arts personally. Uh, I am, however, married to someone who does. Uh, so I, uh, when I was, uh, the, sh the short version of the story, my, my wife went to culinary school. Uh, she's a registered dietitian as well. Um, and when I started graduate school, I took this class called the, uh, the Sociology of Science. And uh, we had to do a, a term paper with some original research components. And around the same time, I was watching a lot of food programming, you know, with my wife, because that's kind of all she did. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we watched, I think it was an episode of Top Chef, where uh, Grant Ackett's was the guest judge. And she was like, Oh, you'd think this guy is cool. Like, let me tell you a little bit about him. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, that's, that is cool. Um, so I started kind of looking into this use of science. And I pitched it as a, uh, as the term paper for this course that I was happened to be in at the same time. Uh, I got a lot of positive feedback on it. And, uh, you know, within a year or two, it was my dissertation topic. So uh, I'm also curious why the journal Poetics? I mean, that's not one that I've uh, referenced a whole lot. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, why that journal? Sure, sure. So Poetics is, um, I don't know if you've taken a look through its pages and seen some of the other articles out there. It's, it's a pretty eclectic journal of uh wow of cultural, uh, cultural studies more, more generally, I was going to say cultural sociology, but that's not quite right because you get 
people from a kind of a wide range of fields. Um, I like, I, I, you know, first and foremost, I just love the articles that journal publishes. And I saw my work uh, having to do with, you know, definitely this cultural field of production and uh, the culinary arts and um, also kind of the organizational aspect of it. We're talking about restaurants and intellectual property. It's such an eclectic kind of collection of, uh, of topics that it just seemed like poetics would be kind of a good place for it. And, uh, you know, so I submitted it there. I got some great reviewers who were really into the topic. And uh, I mean, they were hard on me, but, uh, you know, they they gave me, you know, that's that's the peer review process, right? But uh, absolutely, yeah. They but they gave me a lot of really great feedback. Um, and uh, after a, a revision, you know, sort of transforming the paper and clarifying my points, um, you know, we ended up with a, with a work, workable article, so. That's wonderful. Very, very interesting. Um, all right. So we're going to dive into what you found here, but, you know, real briefly, it looks like you, you really approach this uh, kind of comprehensively. Uh, you did a number of interviews. Uh, sounds like both over the phone, uh, you did some email correspondence, uh, maybe some Zoom as well. And then you also did some observation in kitchens and workshops and other mm -hmm. culinary type um, maybe educational programs, et cetera. Um, I'm fascinated by this idea that you both did interviews and observations. What was the, did those really complement each other? Were there differences that you found between those? Like, how did that all play out? Sure. So, um, yeah, I did, I did interviews, uh, you know, with a range of formats, like you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the people that I, was trying to get in touch with are oftentimes extremely busy um, and they get this email or a phone call from some sociology grad student from <laughs> someplace and they think, what, what do you want from me? You know, um, yeah. and so, you know, you kind of take what you can get, you know, whatever kind of time somebody has for you, you're happy to get it. So, um, so there's a little bit of cobbling together, you know, oh, you want to do an email? Great. We'll talk over email, you know, and, uh, and, uh, or, or, uh, phone conversation that was a very popular option um we did a couple of video chats and then as much in-person interviewing as i could um because i think the the face-to-face -face interviews are always you know you get body language you get kind of the interactions with the, with the world around you that sometimes are a little revealing um you know that's that's sort of the best i uh situation for an interview um now when we're talking about observation um it, it is it is interesting because they seem to go together and they certainly do but it's really great when you get sort of conflict between what somebody says and what they do right so you'll sit down with somebody and do an interview with them and uh you know there's sociologists kind of debate this they talk about there's, there's a paper actually by um a couple of sociologists uh called the attitudinal fallacy and what they say is that if you want to find out what people are doing, you know, uh, ethnography and observation is the only way to do it. Um, that when you talk to somebody, they'll tell you their attitude, but it doesn't tell you anything about what they do. Um, you, you can debate that. I'm, I'm not 100% on board with that. I think that the interviews are certainly valuable and, and I don't think they'd argue that they're not valuable, but uh, you do have to be careful though, that when somebody tells you what they think, it's not always what they do, right? So, um, so, for instance, you'll you'll get situations where you'll talk to somebody and you'll say, "So how do how do you uh, you know how do you use science in your work?" And they'll say, "Oh, well, you know, we do we we it used to be that chefs would just sort of they'd bake a cake and it wouldn't turn out right, so they'd bake another one that you know they tweak a little bit and they'd try it again, and it was just this trial and error process, right? Like now, what I do is I put together, you know, I get a control." And then I measure and then I do five cakes and then I might taste them all at once, you know, whatever. And and they talk about how they'll they'll um, you know control every aspect of the process so that it's identical. Um, but of course, even in science, this isn't exactly what we do because you can't control everything, right? You know, and so it's really interesting to look and see what a chef might think are the most relevant aspects to control in a situation like that as opposed to a scientist who might have very different ideas about it. And it's not, not even necessarily better or worse, but just different. And so seeing what somebody does versus what they describe doing is often very instructive because it gives you an idea of what they 
think of when they're thinking about, say, the experimental process. Um, and it can be really, really useful to have those two things uh, together. That's uh, that's really cool. I saw that. I uh, actually made a mental note. It's like next time I do a study uh, like this, I'll I'll have to remind uh, remember to try to do both both together. So I appreciate that. It's it's an expensive process in in terms of time, you know, because interviews take time, uh, observations take a lot of time. But yeah. uh, but if you can get them, if you can get them both, I think it can be very instructional. So cool. All right. So then. We come to really the, the, the main idea here, right? The, this term open source cooking, which is what's used to describe the, the process or the attitude of openly sharing information uh, now, uh, mostly on the internet. Um, so there, there's both the actual, the behavior of sharing, and then there's the term open source cooking. And so I'm curious about both of those. Uh, I wanna start with the term first. Where did the term come from? It, it seems like it's kind of a combination of both cooking and computer terms, like this the, the idea of open source uh, yeah. software. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You know, um, I I saw it when you when you emailed me a couple of these prep questions. I saw this one. I don't remember. Um, I I don't think I can take credit for it. I'm almost certain that somebody else mentioned it to me. Uh, along the way, somebody else had had sort of maybe even offhandedly mentioned this open source cooking. Um, I went out and I looked, you know, I, I googled it to see if I could like dig up the the origin of this. And it's it's actually kind of everywhere now, right? There be there's all this open source cookbooks and open source uh, collaboration that people are. So the term open source has now been opened up to you know apply to a lot of things so i think tracking down the actual origin is, is nearly impossible at this point which is a real shame because um somebody deserves a lot of credit for coming up with that one it's a good yeah, term it's, it's a cool term okay uh so it probably you know it came out of somewhere as you were doing your research uh but it's obviously describing this this mindset this process of openly sharing uh mostly on the internet but it could have even predated the internet in in many regards mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about the origins that you discovered about this openness to share? Uh, and obviously this is contrasted with what many people uh, remember and in some places still practice this very secretive approach to culinary secrets and recipes and techniques uh, that cooks experience in, in kitchens all, the, all, all around the world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, that, that's sort of what I was comparing it to that's the and that's what my my respondents in this uh project always compared it to is this sort of the old ways as they would describe them of uh of the chef's secret recipe or uh um you know not sharing things and being you know working under a shroud of secrecy of some sort um i think that the truth of the matter is that there's been a lot more collaboration than that um sort of that that characterization is is perhaps not nuanced enough um, for for you know for a long time now we've had cookbooks we've had um, the 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 stage process where you would actually go into somebody's restaurant usually unpaid or paid very little but you would uh, go and you would learn from them for some period of time and then you would go back to wherever you came from and you'd be a better chef for it right so these sorts of collaborations and knowledge uh, practices were were always out there um, before. The big difference is that in an open sharing uh, process, you're putting it out there for anyone to use any way they like. And uh, as, as opposed to say, with the stage process where you will sort of negotiate with somebody, yes, I want you in my kitchen, no, I don't want you, you know? And that might be governed by your relationships with their restaurants. So there might be a chef who's consistently sort of stealing your ideas or, or you know, aping your, uh, your dishes, you don't want their chefs in your, uh, in your restaurant traditionally. Um, you know, whereas in, in this process, if you put it out there, it's for anybody to, to use, you know, however they see fit. And that's the big difference is that you get a wider range of people sharing a wider range of things with a wider audience, you know? So mm -hmm. posting something online for just anybody to read and I could do it, you could do it, um, Wiley Dufresne can do it, you know, any, any, and uh, Farhan Adria, any, anybody from, you know, from me all the way up to them, 
is participating in this uh, in this process in a way that in, is sort of new. I think that's that's the real novel aspect to this process. Yeah, and I mean, I can't help but observe that it seems like this developed alongside the tame frame of food TV, quote unquote, mm -hmm. as well as the internet, and then obviously now social media. I'm curious, I mean, in your conversations uh, with these chefs and, and industry experts, did anyone reference the internet or reference the Food Network or, or as part of the development, not part of the, I'm just curious, did that come up at all? All the time, all the time. Every, I think um, probably every single interview I conducted, uh, somebody mentioned the internet and its importance to this mm. particular movement. Remember, I was specifically trained on you know sort of what i what i call modernist cuisine that you know you might know right. it as molecular gastronomy or whatever that's a very kind of loaded and sensitive term so i try to Indeed. find something a bit more um neutral and amenable to the participants uh so i you know but but this was the group of people i was interested in it was a sort of science oriented chefs and for them you know, learning how to use science in the culinary arts was sort of a, a big ask, right? There's a lot you have to learn. Um, and you're not learning it in culinary school usually. Uh, there was uh, Harold McGee's book from 1984 that was oh, out yes. there that had a lot of, you know, a lot of people would sort of refer to that as their Bible, you know, but it might get them interested, but there's still going to be questions. Be like, okay, so, you know, what if I do this? And there's just nobody to ask, right? So what you end up with is a bunch of people who are kind of out there with a lot of questions and one of them might have studied a lot about you know this little thing you know maybe hydrocolloids and somebody else might be looking at you know the molecular processes under um under where the grilling process or something um you know and and they're all kind of out there with their little uh areas of expertise and the internet's allowing them to come together and it's allowing them to come together and say, I tried this. And somebody else says, oh, you know, I followed your instructions there. Have you thought about doing this? It reduces the time that you need to hold it by 50%. And in a restaurant, that's going to be a really big deal, you know. Um, and uh, so you get these sort of iterations in the way that you see sort of open source software. Um, or, or scientific collaboration, where you'll see one paper come out and another paper build on that in a constructive mm -hmm. way and another paper build on that. So um, everybody described the centrality of the internet uh, to this process because without it, they simply couldn't have communicated with one another and they wouldn't have found each other. So. All right, so the internet definitely was a uh, key to, to this sharing process and its development. And you, I mean, you mentioned the modernist movement or the molecular gastronomy movement. Yes, I agree. Uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, uh, you know, the terms get used uh, back and forth. And you certainly probably could start a bar fight uh, in some places, depending on the term that you 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 choose. You sure there. could. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you were focused on on that set that movement and its pract practitioners. Did you find anyone that referenced chefs? from outside of the movement, right? So in more traditional modes of cuisine that were practicing similar, uh, you know, sharing, uh, you know, uh, attitudes of sharing. I'm, I'm, what I'm getting at is, is this something that uniquely developed in the modernist movement or uh, because of its focus on science or were there other people in other avenues in the culinary world that were also practicing that? That's kind of what I'm curious about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a good question. And I, the short answer, which isn't very satisfying, but the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, okay. I, I can take a stab at guessing though. And my guess is that there wasn't a lot of that because I would imagine that I would have found it. I would have heard about it. Um, the people in this community, uh, a lot of them have, you know, very broad interests, culinarily speaking. Uh, and so they're not just interested in sort of modernist food. They're interested in, you know, breads or, you know, they're pastry chefs or they work with ice cream or they work with whatever. And, um, and I think that if there was another community out there that had this sort of norm at the time, uh, I, I would have heard about it. Now, that said, to some extent, this whole culinary science movement has been a, a victim of its own success in the sense that um, now everybody does it, right? So 
although modernist cuisine had sort of a very distinct style and you could look at people like, you know, Hamaru Cantu or um, Grant Ackett or Wiley Dufresne as being sort of the, uh, the, the, the standard bearers of this, uh, of this movement. Um, the more general approach of using science uh, and, and informing your cooking with uh, scientific knowledge has become fairly mainstream. So sous vide is not particularly experimental anymore. Uh, people have realized, I mean, if you go out for brunch, you're probably enjoying sous vide eggs, you know? Um, and, uh, and it's just not cutting edge anymore, which is, uh, which is great because people, uh, you know, the people that I talk to that are really invested in this approach think that it should be used more widely. And they think that, you know, the entire industry would benefit from a more sort of scientific or systematic approach to experimentation and creativity. Interesting. Well, and in one sense, I mean, at least in some cases, practitioners were going and finding principles that were used more in the food manufacturing space, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, and drawing on that, something that's been talked about enzymes and, you know, some of these heat treatments have been used in the food manufacturing space for yeah. 50 plus years beyond, you know, before. Um, and yeah. so it's, it's gaining, it's spreading out in its influence, which is awesome. I mean, as a, as someone in the science, uh, the field of science, it's, it's neat to see those principles and those findings actually applied in operational <laughs> context, rather than yeah. just sitting on, you know, in someone's library, you know, just, just <laughs> sitting there on a shelf. Yep. Yep. No, that's, um, th that was one of the, the most interesting parts of this project to me was seeing how this uh, movement had blurred the line between sort of fine dining uh, and the, 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 like the food industry, you know, industrial applications. And uh, some of the people I interviewed, um, uh, there's Ted Russin at um, the Culinary Institute of America, who is part of their, um, uh, part of their culinary science program there. He got his start uh, working at uh what was it copenhagen pectin um and uh he was working there he happened to have a culinary degree he and and at some point they started getting these phone calls from chefs who were like hey you've got this product can you send me a sample like i don't need two gallons of it i need like you know a pint right and uh and and of course they didn't know what to do with these guys so you know ted said let me talk to him and he became this kind of liaison to fine dining and there were all of these new kind of synergies that have popped up as a result where you know okay so you're not selling truckloads of methyl cellulose to you know to fine dining restaurants the way that you might be to you know frito-lay or you know cisco or whoever but um but you are what you are getting out of it is sort of it legitimizes your ingredients in a way that you know, they might have been uh, denigrated before, you know, oh, don't eat anything you can't pronounce or whatever. It'd be like, well, Correct. you know, <laughs> that. Uh, but then the other thing you get is new applications, right? Because these chefs are extremely yeah. creative and they might come up with things that you would never have thought of. And now you can make a whole new family of products out of that. It's a whole new way to sell pectin to the world. So these uh, these synergies were a really interesting kind of um, well, two, two worlds I saw I thought of as almost opposed to one another, you know, or the kind of joining together with this mutual interest. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like having, uh, you know, independent R and, you know, research and development scientists out there all across the world yeah. uh, coming up with yeah. new uses for your product. Yeah. Yeah. And there, and there are people who are very suspicious of that. Right. So, um, you know, True. some of the chefs that I spoke to were like, I don't share, those guys are going to steal my ideas or, um, you know, there was, there was one person who had advised his head chef not to take the ten thousand dollars to go and talk to you know whatever company pepsico or whoever it was that wanted to talk to him he said i know ten thousand dollars seems like a lot of money right now but your ideas are worth more than that you know and uh you know right. I, i'm making up the ten thousand dollar you know it could have been a right. hundred thousand it could have been ten dollars i don't remember but but he had advised uh not to do that because you know he felt we don't know what they're going to do with it. We don't know, you know, so there is some tension that remains, but it is absolutely true that you have this whole new group of people who are thinking about your products 
and how to use them. And that has got to be great for these companies, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Which, so, I mean, that leads into this idea of sharing the information broadly. Uh, I, I, I can't remember who, which one of your participants or chefs used the phrase. It's like, it's a way of patenting my ideas. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So in one sense, it's, it's kind of like patenting, but at the same time, it's not giving you exclusivity. It's more like giving yep. you the recognition and the, the esteem among your peers for coming up with, with the idea. Um, that came out of one of your, your interviews, right? That kind of insight. I believe it was a quote from a magazine by a Ferran Adria who okay. said, you know, we put these cookbooks out because this is the way we, this is the way we stake our claim. We publish and it's like patenting our recipes. And, um, you know, that was a translation from a Spanish language uh, magazine interview. So, um, you know, maybe patenting wasn't quite the word, but, um, but I, I would say that it's not quite like patenting. I think you're right. I think that it's um, it is a way to stake a claim and say I did this, um, but it's more like publishing in the scientific sense, right? So be I was the one who came up with this idea. I was the one who you know, um, and you you put that out there and say you can do whatever you want with it, but this was my idea, and everybody can see it now because I put it out there. So cookbook publishing has traditionally been a way of doing that, but it's not available to everybody, right? You know, we, I can't publish a cookbook. Um, the, the Ferran Audrey, of course, he can publish cookbooks as long as he likes. Uh, the rest of us don't always have that, uh, that, that option. So if we invent something and we want to uh, stake a claim in the world, uh, this publishing, you know, the open sharing, kind of putting it out on the internet, and saying like it's mine, like that was that's a very attractive way of doing it. But it uh, it ends up being a lot more like the scientific sense of publication than it is like patenting in uh, in the legal process. Right. So it's more like staking your a claim to the intellectual property that you created it, uh, and you're putting it out there a so people give you credit, and b mm -hmm. so that other people can can build upon it. Absolutely. Those are the I think the two biggest. Um, and the, the two biggest ways that people personally benefit from it is uh, getting credit. And then there's a sort of the, the, the primary credit of somebody saying like, did you see what Nathan invented? That's pretty right. cool. I tried it. And my customers loved it. Um, and then there's the secondary credit that you get through citation, right? So somebody built upon a technique that you invented and said, oh, well, you know, he sets the uh the the agar but then i wrapped it in cheesecloth and let it drain faster you know and so you'd be like okay well this is a collaborative effort now and you both get credit for coming up with a new process right right and and this leads to i think the way you term it is uh like a peer-based recognition system um which would you contrast to uh, the, the very traditional, like critic based recognition system. We have restaurant critics and, uh, they'll go out and obviously review restaurants, et cetera. Um, as a former cook, having worked back of the house primarily, I immediately thought about, so as a cook, the peer based recognition you used to get was who you worked for, right? Like, oh, well yeah. you worked for whoever, right? A Tim Keller, yeah. et cetera, right? And, and that, those were part of your credentials of who, who you worked for. This seems to add to that. So it's not only who you work for, but what you have produced and mm -hmm. contributed to, to the world. That's, that's right. So the, I think certainly that, um, you know, the, the reputation based uh, through association is still an important uh, aspect of the, the Sort of culinary field in general, right? So having being uh, in in the same way that you know, academics are students of this person or that person, uh, you are uh, sort of a uh, an apprentice of you know whatever chef you you might have worked under, uh, and and people gain esteem through that uh, through that association. Um, but at the end of the day, the people you so if you're uh, a if you worked under uh, Thomas Keller. For instance, the reason Thomas Keller is who he is is a, in in large part due to uh, critical acclaim, right? So the Michelin stars, the James Beard awards, that sort of stuff. So um, you know there is this relationship that 
chefs and restaurants have to the critical world, it's very, very important to them. Um, even though they don't like to admit it all the time, uh, you know, you'll, you'll talk to people about critical acclaim and they'll say, you know, I don't cook for those guys. And, uh, you know, some of them will be pricklier than others, but, uh, but the general idea is like, I'm not chasing critical acclaim here. I'm trying to make good food. I'm trying, I, it, it's more important to me that my customers like it or that my, my friends like it, you know, that like my peers like it, um, you know, that we're the ones who know. And so there's always been this tension about, um, you know, what critics think versus what chefs are doing. And, uh, you know, critics lack the expertise. They don't know what it's like in the kitchen. They don't know what we're going through. They don't, you know, um, so there's a, there's a huge attraction to this peer-based recognition, right? You know, where we can do this internally. We don't need critics to tell us what's good and what's not. We can, we can build upon one another's work. We don't need, uh, you don't need critical acclaim to get attention in this, uh, in this way. You just need say uh, today i would say probably an instagram account um you know when i was writing this instagram wasn't really a primary means of uh transmission for this information but i, I think today it's much more popular um and uh I, I think that you know the two work hand in hand is the other thing that's important to say about this that if there's a chef out there that is getting a lot of recognition among their peers for any reason whether it's because of the things they're sharing on Instagram or because of any other reason, and they're getting ignored by critics, eventually you're going to see critics start to take notice because in their interviews with other chefs, like they're going to hear about this person and they're going to say, oh, this, this, this chef, i had never heard about them. Like maybe I should go and, and check out their restaurant or whatever. So I have this kind of untested theory that any time these two things get too far out of whack, there are certain forces that will kind of bring them together into closer correlation. That critical acclaim and peer acclaim are, uh, are, are closely related. Yeah. And I mean, the, the peer system, even though it's happening on the internet for the most part, uh, so it's, it's open for anyone to go see, uh, you reference the fact that it's the, the language used and uh, the way it's presented really is it's targeted towards other peers. So even though the public yeah. can consume it or uh, critics can consume it, uh, it really is, it's almost like a microcosm type communication, even though it's open for the world to see. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, you know, this is that, that question you had about explicit and tacit knowledge, right? Which is right. a, uh, um, this is a, a distinction that sociologists and, uh, and scholars of uh, science and technology have made for a long time. So you've got on one hand explicit knowledge, which is the kind of stuff you can write down. You know, um, any anything in a in a recipe would be an example of explicit knowledge. So the ingredients, the uh, the the ratios, the uh, the technique, all of that is explicit knowledge. Um, but in order to actually make use of that explicit knowledge, you always need some kind of tacit knowledge, uh, and that's true in cooking. It's true in uh, nuclear physics, it's true everywhere that um, there are some great articles about this and how um, scientists can't reproduce one another's work no matter how closely they follow the instructions because yeah. there's something they left out, you know, that just doesn't, you know, um, that doesn't translate. And so you'll see this in badly written recipes, right, where somebody forgot to mention, oh, you know, <laughs> you need this this meringue needs a butane torch on it before it's going to look the way it does in the picture. You never said that. You'd be like, eh, okay, that's common sense to a chef, but a home cook might wonder what the heck they did wrong, right? Um, yeah. And and the and the example I use in the paper, I think, is a is a I, I love this example um, because it's it's a Will Goldfarb tweet that he tweeted out at like three in the morning his time in Bali, and uh, you know God knows what was going on in his kitchen, but he was like, I've got this almond sponge recipe. And in 140 characters, he tweets out, it's just a set of ingredients. And most of the ingredients are so tightly abbreviated that you'd never know what they are if you didn't, if you weren't in that world. So, you know, two, uh, 10 mil, you know, E48 methyl, you know, something like that. And, and, and I'm, I'm getting the details not quite right, but it's that kind of thing where if, if you work in that world, you know exactly what that is. And uh, I would ask people about this. I'd say, like, what about these, you know, recipes? And you say, oh, yeah, you know, and they kind of laugh and say, yeah, if you work in that world, 
you know, okay, I'm going to have to take these things. These are the dry ingredients. These are the wet ingredients. You typically cook it this way. I'm going to try that. But there's so much left out that if you're just a home cook trying to follow along with what Will Goldfarb is doing, like, you know, good luck to you, <laughs> you know, right, but, but right. his peers in the industry are going to know what to do. Well, and I mean, to those that have kind of opposed this sharing because they're afraid that someone's going to steal their secrets, right? I mean, because of this explicit in, uh, tacit knowledge dichotomy, it's not like a culinary student or, you know, a, a home cook um, or, or really anyone without that tacit knowledge could just take that and run with it and even just create the simple dish, much less create a whole restaurant around it. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, this is this is one of my favorite quotes about this. this was um, I was having an email exchange with Nick Konis at a, a linear restaurant in Chicago, and I was asking him a lot about this. Um, you know, we, we went back and forth two or three times, I think, and I kept asking him about this intellectual property issue. And like, right. aren't you scared about getting ripped off, especially because it's not hypothetical in their situation? Like they're their restaurant, their their recipes were used in kind of an infamous case with this this Australian restaurant that had um, taken sort of cobbled together a bunch of recipes from various uh, notable chefs and offered them up at their own restaurant. Um, so I asked, you know, I was like, is this something you're concerned about? You know, just giving away these recipes, just giving away these techniques. And uh, at some point in our exchange, I think he lost patience with me because he was like, you don't get it. He was like, this is really hard to do. You know, I can give you any, any, um, he, he wrote that, uh, you know, I can give you the script, but that doesn't mean you can put Shakespeare on every night, you know, like you need, you need the crew, you need actors, you need a stage, you need equipment. It's so much more than just that recipe. You know, you can have your script, but it doesn't mean you can do Shakespeare in the park. And I, I think that's a, just a fantastic way of putting it because it really makes clear the difference between knowing how to do something and actually doing it at the level that these restaurants are, are performing every single night. Right. Right. And I think you mentioned this, uh, hopefully I'm not putting words in your mouth, but uh, there's even the, the aspect of the community is so small that even if you were able to kind of rip off, right. All these, these recipes and try to put a restaurant together, everyone's going to know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> That's right. I, that's that's another thing about it. And this might be unique to this modernist movement because it is such a tight community. Um, and because it's very important to them to know who invented what. So they all have these mental maps of where they got this idea and who invented that and who developed this, where this is going. You know, they, they, they know these things and it's important to them that they know it um, and that they give credit when uh, when it comes up. So it's absolutely true that when somebody does rip something off, um, it's probably going to get noticed. And in fact, you know, as, as illustrated in this case in, uh, in, in Australia, you know, people noticed it was kind of a big deal in the movement. People were, you know, there, there were a bunch of, I think the New York Times covered it at some point. And, uh, you know, um, that said, there is, there's an aspect to this where the, the status hierarchy isn't totally gone, right? Um, the fact of the matter is a chef with a restaurant or a notable chef that people are looking at, if, if that's the first time you've ever seen a new technique at this chef's, you know, you go to a restaurant and you see this technique, that doesn't mean they invented it, right? But it means that probably you're going to think they invented it because they, you know, you've never seen it before. And if it was just like something that I invented over here, working in my, you know, little kitchen in, in Brooklyn, um, you know, uh, you might never know that. And even if that chef tried to set the record straight, sometimes, you know, of course it's already out of the barn at that point. There's, there's no, there's no going back and undoing it and kind of correcting the record. So um, the fact of the matter is, you know, the, the, the chefs that are already known are working with a, with an advantage here. So it doesn't completely democratize things in the way that, you know, we might want to think it does. Right. Yeah, I, I know you you had a whole conversation about this in your paper about uh, in one sense, this allows a cook or even someone that's not a cook to, uh, you know, put their ideas out there and develop things. Uh, but they may not have the audience for people to really recognize it. And so either 
in many cases, unintentionally, someone else could get the credit because they start using it and they yeah. simply have the larger audience. Uh, even when that citation is there, I mean, I'm sure this happens. This happens in the science world all the time that someone makes yeah, an definitely. initial finding, but then the the person that builds upon that, their finding just gets more PR basically, and so yeah. unfortunately, their name gets associated with it rather than the the founder. And I mean, I think in history we could also say there have been lots of instances where um, people from disadvantaged groups came up with something and yep. didn't didn't get the recognition that someone else got it for. So that that power struggle still exists. Yeah, I think absolutely that's that's true, and it's it's true at at every scale. So you mentioned you know sort of disadvantaged groups or marginalized communities or you know whether we're talking about you know, a, uh, a chef going to some village in South America and learning a new technique and then coming out, getting credit for it. You know, there's a sort of cultural appropriation that um, I think is, uh, is an example of this. But, you know, we call this um, in sociology, the, one of the terms for this is the Matthew effect, which is the idea that, you know, the basic idea here is that the rich get richer, right? So somebody who's in a, in a high esteemed position already in, in this case is going to have more eyes on them and so they're going to get more recognition for their work, uh, even if they're not the first one to do it. Uh, and even if they're not trying to take credit for things uh, that they didn't invent, it's just kind of the way it works, you know? So like you said, in science where, you know, somebody might come up with an idea and then a perhaps more well-known or more prestigious uh, scientist comes along and uses that idea, everybody remembers that name and be like, oh yeah, that, you know, she's the one who, who did this and, you know, whoever actually came up with the ideas sort of lost the history. But thankfully, I mean, it seems like at least among your, your um, participants, the people you talk to, uh, those with the platform, right. Those with the restaurants and, and the following, it, they try really hard to make sure that they're giving credit, uh, you know, as, as much as possible. Um, and this has, I guess, both fed out of, but also help to reinforce this idea of culinary ethics and the way that you cite where you get ideas and, and recipes mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's been a, um, that was an interesting tension that comes up all the time is that everybody really wants to cite their, their influences, but nobody really knows how. So, you know, that it's a, uh, there, there, there's no, you know, in, in, in academic work, we just put a little citation, you know, whether it's a footnote right. or, a, you know, in brackets next to your uh, your claim or whatever. We have a very uh, well-established tradition of citing people for their ideas. Um, it's not like that at a restaurant, right? And so people actually would joke to me. It was like, I, I actually thought about putting a work cited uh, section in my menu, you know, and, uh, you know, having just be like, look, you know, I've read enough articles. I know how it's done now. And, uh, you know, they, uh, and, and they talk about that. I've never seen it. I don't know if anybody's, uh, seriously, but, but you do occasionally see, uh, after uh, you'll go to a restaurant, you'll see on the menu kind of the, the description of a dish. And then maybe in parentheses, it'd be like originally served here or right. built on this person's inspired by whatever. And so you are seeing this to some degree, you know, even though uh, it was oftentimes brought up as a joke, um, you know, that it, like how absurd would it be to have a work cited or a bibliography in my, uh, in my menu. But, um, but you're actually seeing stuff like that now because I think it is really important to people um, that they give credit and that they're not seen as, you know, thieves. You know, they don't want to, they, they want to be, they want to get credit for what they did and not credit for what somebody else did. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, and at some point, I mean, do you go back and do you cite Escoffier and Karim, you know, for, <laughs> for the mother sauces yeah. and uh, those types of things? Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that occurs to me, so this goes back to my episode with uh, Dr. Lee uh, when he was dealing with the, the pastry chef sharing on Instagram. A lot of those that were sharing, they were including the, the Instagram handle, right? So they were actually tagging uh -huh. uh, the creator either in the post or in the comments and uh, obviously, that doesn't play out on a menu <laughs> nearly as well. Uh, but that was <laughs> that was one example of citation that mm -hmm. you know came out through his research that I think plays into this. Yeah, yeah, definitely online there are uh, better tools for this. Uh, like you said, it doesn't play out on a, on, a, on a menu so well. But on Instagram, it's great. On Twitter, it's there's no problem at all. You can you, you can uh, you can do this 
just fine. Awesome. Well, I want to be mindful of our time here. There are just a couple more things I want to ask you about. One, I just want to mention uh, for my listeners, my audience, uh, you you also kind of talk about the creation of a, almost a new role, whether they're called research chefs or culinary consultants, mm -hmm. uh, that almost a whole new job position has been created yeah. out of this this sharing uh, movement, which is I think is really cool. Yeah, that was um, one of the one of the interesting sort of side effects of this practice, I think, is that because there are other ways to get recognition to build a reputation, you see people no longer aspiring exclusively to run their own restaurant, right? So that's typically the way you get recognition is by being the head of a restaurant. Otherwise, you're just working for somebody who runs a restaurant. Um, and all of your reputation is sort of by proxy, like we talked about before. Um, in this sort of expression of status, if you get to become known as somebody who's innovative and creative and able to um, you know, help with these kinds of problems uh, in the culinary world, you can go out on your own and work as a consultant, which a lot of people have done. Uh, and then the other thing is that some of the more uh, uh, the, the, some of the, the larger restaurant groups actually open up their own research kitchens. So, um, you know, David Chang has his research kitchen. Um, there are a couple others that I can think of that aren't, I suppose, public knowledge, but um, that there are, there are people who are doing this and, um, and they've, they've devoted their resources to just having a space where they have new equipment and they bring in, you know, maybe they'll bring in scientists to come collaborate with them on projects and, uh, you know, they'll actually do this. So it's an entirely new arm of the kitchen organization besides, you know, you got like the, the back of the house, the front of the house and the research group, you know? Um, and, and that's, I think a really cool development because it gives people in the industry a new, uh, uh, kind of a new option for, for a career. Uh, they could be consultants. They could be research chefs. There's there's big new things they can do. Absolutely, yeah, I love that development. And so, even though we haven't really uh, said this explicitly, right? So, the, to kind of recap here, it seems like the motivations that people uh, are are well are being motivated by uh, to to share kind of fall into the idea of protection uh, to protect their ideas, altruism because it's good for the community, it's good for the culinary arts. Um, or to gain recognition or some combination of those three. I think those are the three terms that you use there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's right. It, it, those are the, the three main um, incentives that people use to, to share this stuff openly. Um, you know, you might ask somebody what their main incentive is and they might give you an answer and it's really hard to know uh, how sincere that answer is, you know, and, and it, it's not to say that they're lying or whatever, but it's just that we all, I think, I think protecting your own work is something that's maybe more important to people than we might want to admit, you know, and that's probably true for all of us, um, you know, so, but, but those are definitely the benefits. Uh, so whatever is behind somebody, whatever's motivating them, those are certainly the benefits of doing it. Awesome. Uh, all right. So your research is different than most of the research I've, I've uh, focused on on the podcast in that it's more exploratory and descriptive than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of data driven in a way to provide tactics for operators. Um, but I'm curious. I always ask my, my guests this. So I still want to uh, ask you, you know, if you owned a restaurant um, or uh, were training cooks or culinary students, how would you use your findings uh, in that endeavor? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's one that I should, I think, as academics, we don't think about that often, right? You know, unless we're in business schools or one of the more applied areas. Um, so what, when when I saw that question on your list, it threw me for a loop uh, and uh, spent a lot of time thinking about it. And uh, I, I think that the, um, I think that for restaurateurs and 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 head chefs. This is a great opportunity to use open sharing and collaboration like this as a retention tool right now. So like right now we're talking about a, uh, a moment in time where, you know, the great resignation is upon us. And uh, from what I've read, uh, service staff are especially, um, uh, you know, the churn is especially heavy in the service industries and a lot of restaurants are having a hard time keeping staff. 
Uh, I think that formalizing structures that allow your lower level kitchen staff to participate in collaboration and get credit for the parts that they're uh, that they're contributing. So, um, you know, having an Instagram, everybody in the Instagram, you know, say, oh, this person put this together uh, and letting them kind of plant that flag and say like, okay, so I'm just the, you know, pastry sous chef here, but this was mine. And, you know, so diners might not know that, but people who are involved enough or, or embedded enough to go to the Instagram site and check out their stuff, they're going to know that they're going to say, oh, this, these people are doing really cool work and it can kind of work as a portfolio for you. And I think that restaurants that had that kind of a structure would really set themselves apart, both in terms of their mentorship because you get a reputation for being a great place to work and, uh, and for incentivizing their lower level employees for sticking around as opposed to just taking the next job that's out there because it won't afford those kind of opportunities. You know, right. that's one, um, I think really great tool that this open sharing opens up for, uh, for business owners, um, for, for young chefs who are starting out and like thinking about how they can develop their careers. I think that thinking broadly about your intellectual property and how it's used, how you build relationships in the industry and understanding those benefits in a way that's perhaps broader than is typically taught, you know, like you, the, the, the traditional culinary school methods of, of um, you know, top down chef secrets, that sort of stuff. It's still very much alive today. And I think that if you just keep in mind that it doesn't have to be that way and there's another path that might benefit you, um, you know, keeping that in mind is, is, I think, really important and perhaps powerful for chefs who want to go down this kind of road. Awesome. I love those, uh, those applications there. So uh, to recap, um, we have the ones that you just mentioned, right? Uh, the idea that a restaurant could uh, use this as a way to um, both incentivize and uh, help their, their staff um, to build a reputation uh, and uh, basically be a better workforce uh, a workplace uh, because of it um, that for students or cooks that um, they should consider that there are other ways uh, to approach their intellectual property, possibly to kind of broaden the horizons of what their intellectual property is uh, and how they can collaborate. Uh, then I would add to that. Uh, I just, I think it's helpful to see all the contrasts that your research pulled out. Right. So the idea of the critic based versus the peer based um, recognition systems, uh, the way that head chefs can leverage uh, this sharing versus unknown cooks um, or people without that that platform. Um, and uh, then also just the, the different motivations, as we as we talked about there. Right. Protection versus uh, altruism or, or being good to the industry and uh, the recognition. Uh, I like those contrasts. I, I love categorizing things. So I think that's particularly helpful. Um, and. Uh, again, takeaway, I love the fact that uh, this movement and the sharing has resulted in new jobs and, and job positions uh, for people and career paths. I mean, I, I can really see where someone earns their, their credentials and their chops in a kitchen to learn, you know, what it's like to work on the line, et cetera, but then long term moves into more of that R&D position or that consultant yeah. position, which you know, as your back starts to give out and your knees start to hurt or you have a family, like, I think that's a really nice career path where you get both the operations and the, uh, the work-life balance long-term. Uh, yep. And, uh, and then just, I mean, definitely I'm going to take away uh, talking about this idea to, uh, to students. Obviously I teach more on the hospitality side, uh, but I think this is particularly helpful for culinary students uh, to to keep in mind, it's it's an avenue or an aspect that's not really been talked about much. So um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for spending your time. Absolutely. I really enjoyed uh, being able to, to talk about it again. Thank you for tuning in to today's show. If you have questions or comments, please leave a comment in the section below. I would love to hear from you, hear what your thoughts are on this very interesting subject. If you have a chef friend or someone that works in hospitality, please share this with them uh, so we can uh, spread the word and get their thoughts as well. Ciao.